QuickBooks Online 2024 Bank Rules Split into Two Accounts and Classes. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to save time with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online bank fee practice file we set up in a prior presentation, opening the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports on the left hand side within the favorites right-clicking on that balance sheet to open a link in a new tab, right-clicking on the profit and loss to open a link in a new tab, right-clicking the trusty TB to open a link in a new tab. If you don't have that trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it. Let's tab to the right, close up the hamburger and change the range. We're going from 010124 tab, 033124 tab, selecting the dropdown to see it in month format, run it. Let's tab to the right, close the hamburger again, change the range. We're going from 010124 tab, 033124 tab, selecting the drop down to see it in months, running it. Tapping to the right one more time, closing the hamburger and changing that range in 010124 tab, 033124 tab, run it once again to refresh it. Let's go to the balance sheet. We're going to be thinking about our bank feed rules again. This time, we want to be breaking out a transactions that are going to be coming from the same vendor into multiple accounts, possibly breaking them out into multiple departments, for example. We did a similar type of thing if I jump on over to the income statement for the income side of things we're going to do basically the same type of thing if we had an expense type of account so if we go back to our bank rules let's go to the first tab and go into the transactions and when we create our bank transactions here we've been constructing our rules as we go the rules are being compiled in this rules tab the easiest rule to make are with those accounts that are electronic transfers and are repetitive such as this phone bill rule where we just have one rule that we need to apply for the information that should be popping up in the uh, memo section of the bank feeds if it's an electronic transfer which often contains a name that we can use for the vendor and then say I would like that to go to one particular account in this case the telephone account however if we have one vendor that we buy multiple things from then we we might need to break that one vendor out in some way shape or form sometimes when we have the bank text if I go back into the bank transactions when we look at this bank information, sometimes that gives an indication as to the differences in the types of transactions. When we, locked, when we looked at the revenue side of things, we mentioned that, for example, if, if you get revenue from Amazon, you might be getting revenue from Amazon Books, 
or Amazon affiliate marketing or Amazon's uh, Amazon uh, Video Prime or something. Or you might have different locations that are giving you money even though it's still coming from Amazon. So some of those things might indicate then uh, be indicated by the bank detail which could give you a way to break out the transaction between multiple accounts or classes. So let's think about that on an expense side of thing. I'm going to make up some data again that will come through the bank feeds. So we're going to say this is going to be the date. This is going to be the amount. And then this is going to be the description. And let's say the date is three. Let's say uh, 21 to four. And we have an amount that is uh, that is uh, 100 or 210. And this description, I'm just going to put test uh, expense. And that's going to be like the vendor name that we'll say. And let's say that there was some bank jargon like this. But then at the end of it, it has something like, uh, like P12 or something. And let's say that that P12, for whatever reason, indicated one location. Or it might even say like California, for example, uh, versus a, another location, right? So then if we had multiple of these, if it was on 325, 24, and we had another 114 test expense, different jargon on the number, but it still has this dash California on it. And then if we had one that was on uh, 326, uh, 24, 494, let's say we had a test expense and it had the bank jargon and then it had uh, this time uh da -da, an na na on it or uh so so then i'm going to say that's a different that might indicate a different location a different state right and then on 327 uh 24 we, we have like 82 test expense and this is going to be bank jargon, da, 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 but then it says NA. So then we, we can say, well, this is coming from this. We're paying the same vendor here, but we have these two items at the end, which could give an indication that it's by location, for example. And we might be able to utilize that information in the bank text. Let's make these negative this time. Do it properly so that we don't have to reverse them because these are going out of the bank. And then I'm going to save this. We're going to say file, save as, save as. We'll make it a d -d -d CSV file. Save it as a CSV file and OK. So then let's go back into our QuickBooks. And we're in the bank transactions. We're going to select the drop down, upload from a file, select the file. And we want this one to be the 670 is the newest one. That's the one we want. And we will then continue. Select the drop down. It's going to go into the checking account and continue. It's going to be yes, one column, dates formatted, uh, M, M, D, D, Y, 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 O, Y. Okay. <laughs> I over dramatized the wise. It's a it's a date date description description amount amount that looks good. We're going to continue. And so these are decreases that looks good. Let's select all of them. And we're going to say, do it. Let's do it. Did, is it going to work? Can we get there? Boom. It's done. Okay, so then we're going to say let's let's filter this and say that this is going to be uh, money out and so now we have our test transactions so now we can go into these and I would like to apply them to one location or another there's a couple different ways that we might set up our locations we might as we did before on the income side of things try to set up a different account per location that's method number one method number two is to use the class tracking so that we can that we can have a different column on the income statement, noting that class tracking typically applies to income statement accounts. So let's let's first take a look at our chart of accounts. I'll go to the chart of accounts. 
I'm going to make a new account and I'm going to make a parent account and just call it an expense account. It's going to be an other expense account, other business expense. And I'm just going to call it test expense, expen expense account. All right, generic account name. I'm going to copy that and then I'll save it. And then I'm going to make two accounts subordinate to it by location. So I'm going to say new and let's do another one expense account. And it's going to be an other kind of expense. And then I'm going to put L1 test expense account. And this will be subordinate to the test expense account. Right, and then I'll do another one, which will be location two. We're imagining these are our locations, location one and two. I know it's awfully generic, but bear with me. But don't worry, it's just a teddy bear. That's with, bear with me, the bear with me is a teddy bear. Uh, other, this is gonna be other, other business expense. Bear with me. This is going to be uh, location two, and then we'll make this subordinate to test. Uh, there we go. All right, let's go ahead and save that. And so if we go down then and find that, I'm looking at the account types. We're in the expenses. Here's our test expense. Here's location one, location two. So when we populate these on the income statement, it will be in the income, uh, the expense side, and it will have a drop down, and then these two can be collapsed into the little triangle drop down once they have numbers in them. Let's go to the bank transactions now, and I can go into these transactions. Let's go into the California one first, and we'll say this is gonna be test expense. And so notice that I could make a different vendor. Like I might want to say test expense for California and, and break it out that way, even though it's basically the same company, because then I can possibly sort my data by, you know, the test expense that we're paying to one location versus another. So I'll go ahead and do that this time since we did it the other way last time. Uh, uh, we'll say, okay, it's a vendor. Now I'm going to assign it to a class. This one's California. I'm going to say is location number one. And then no tag memo. We can create a rule for it and say this is going to be test expense for Cal for location one, let's say. And then it's going to be money out. All conditions must be met. I like to use the bank text that it contains. I don't want to have all the jargon here. Now note that if the California was right after the test expense, then I might be able to just keep the whole thing. And that would be fine because, because then I wouldn't need another rule because there would be a distinguishing factor by the CA versus the NA. But notice that all this other stuff kind of messes it up because it's in between. So for example, if I just delete all this stuff and say, I want, I want you to find the rule if it has test expense and this California with just one line item, it might work, but notice it didn't. And you're like, well, why didn't it work? Because all of this is in the bank text, but, but notice it can't see it because it had this jargon in the middle. It has to be kind of like in order. So it's like, all right, well, then I'll just make two rules. Like if I delete this, then it'll find all four of them, but I only want it to find two. So I'll just make another rule for bank text and say, let's say it contains, and this is where I'll put the California. So, it, so now I don't have to have it all connected to each other. And so I said, test the rule. Now two out of four have been met. It looks like it's correct. So let's do it now. We're gonna say that it's an expense, inventory asset, recommended vendor, test California, location one on the class and it's not going to record automatically. So I'm going to say, okay, let's save it. Boom. And there it is. There it is right there. It's rule has been applied. Rule has been applied. Let's take those and check them off. 
rules have been applied. There are rules, confirm. Go to the balance sheet, run it. And this happened, uh, I think, in the checking account over here. So I'm gonna say, duh, it's a decrease. And we said this was a payment to the test expense. There they are, going back and then on the profit and loss, it's not there because I messed up. So let's go back to the first tab. And if something like that happens, I can try to troubleshoot. So I can go in here and say, well, wait a second. I, I recorded it in here and I see I have my test expense. The other side's going to inventory. That doesn't look right, right? So some, so I messed, I didn't put the proper account. So let's go back to the first tab and then it's already been recorded. So if I'm looking at the uh, bank transactions, I could go to the categorized transactions now and I could say, okay, here's the test expense on this one and the test expense here. Now I could go into these and adjust them, but the rule has been applied and the rule is wrong. So let's say if I take these two and I go, okay, I'm, I messed up on this one and this one. And I'm going to just say, let's undo that. And then, so undo two transactions. So, and then I'll bring them back over here. And so they're back over here with the test expenses. The rules are applied. Let's fix the rule. So I'm going to go into the rule now and say, you messed up the rule. Let's edit it. And I have it going for some reason to the inventory account, which was the default account chosen by QuickBooks, which is wrong. I would almost prefer QuickBooks didn't, you know, choose an account like that. It would just... <laughs> leave it, leave it blank. So it wouldn't record right until I chose an account, but this is going to be, can't really, I'm trying to blame QuickBooks on it, you know, but here's a L1 test expense. I think that's the one we want, right? Am I right? I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant now. I think that's the one though. Okay. So now let's save the rule and now it should apply the new rule. If I go back to the bank transactions, so I can go into here and say, all right, there's the test expenses. Uh, if I go into it, it's applying it to the test to the test expense account. Let's try to add it again. So we will add that one and this one. And I'll say, let's confirm. Okay. And then if I go back to the balance sheet and run it, it should be updated here. Let's go to the profit and loss and run it here and see if it ap appears properly on this side. So now we have the drop down of test expense and we have the class of, uh, actually I, I changed the classes cause I was researching this. So if I didn't have the classes on, it would look like this where we would have the test uh, expense account and then the subordinate account to it broken out by location one and then the information. Now, if you do have class tracking, Note that to turn on class tracking, we've done it in the past, but you could go to the cog up top, account and settings, and then it's in the advanced. And then within the advanced, we are on the categories and we turned on class tracking. Location tracking is similar. Class tracking is a little bit more, uh, gives you a little bit more flexibility. So we have courses and sections on class tracking versus location tracking versus uh, tags and how you might use those if you want to dive into that in more detail. But this is just to give an idea of how they fit in possibly to bank feeds. So if I select the drop down and search this by classes, now I can see the columns broken out by class, class one and two, which I'm imagining are location or department one and two. And then down under my uh, expenses that we had here, there was my income line item. And so there it is. It changed the date on me. So there it is. Test expense uh, uh, L1 location. Let's do the same for the second one. So I'm going to go back to the first tab. Let's see if we could do this a little bit more cleanly this time. And we'll say that this is going to be this one. I'm going to say this is test expense. Boom. This time I'm going to put for NA to have another vendor separate, even though it's the same vendor, but we want to have it sorted by the location. I'm not going to put it into inventory, but uh, rather we're going to put it into location two test expense. 
the class is going to be L2 this time. And then the memo is good. We will create a rule for it. It's going to be test expense location 2. It will be a money out rule. And once again, I'm just going to keep the test expense, delete the last bit, and put the NA. So if I do that, it has two of them, which is all that's left here. So that should be right, actually. But then I'm going to say in here, it's NA. And it should still pick up those two that are left. It's going to go into an expense. The category is correct this time. Location two. Let's save it. All right. So then we have these have been applied. Boom, boom. Let's tag those off and confirm. All right, so then if I go into the balance sheet, we should be able to run it again. We should have a decrease to the checking account for these four uh, expenses. So we have the four, the test expenses. These two are the new ones that we put in place. Let's go back. And then, and more importantly, on the income statement, we have now broken them out by that difference in the text memo. And here they are. So, so notice if you, you don't, it's redundant to have two expense accounts and two classes, meaning you could, for example, have it look like this, where you just have one test expense account, break it out by class this way. But if you don't have classes, then maybe instead of using classes, you might do something like this, so you can get some idea of the breakout between the locations in sub accounts. And you could do both, because by doing both, you'll be able to catch errors. Meaning if something's in location one on the class, but location two in the account, one of those is clearly wrong and you can drill down on the source data and properly put it into the proper account. So it can give you kind of a, a double check. It can also let you see the detail this way and collapse it this way so that for external reporting, you still can give it to someone with just one account. Meaning you can you can create a collapsed report like this and it removes that little drop down uh, entirely so that you just have with no drop down right here. Okay, so let's bring it back to expanding it. If I go back to the first tab, I just want to point out that you, you have to make sure that you have the memos section on in order to see the bank detail if you're going to do something like that. Because by default, I believe in this cog drop down that QuickBooks uh, says that they're going to not show the bank details. They have this unchecked by default, which means that some of this numbers and stuff uh, might not be there all the time. So if I check on that, see how the numbers have appeared again. So I always check that off because I don't trust the AI to know exactly what I should be picking. Basically, when you check that off, QuickBooks is trying to clean it up and say, hey, look, this part of the bank memo description is what you might need to create the customer or vendor and all the other stuff we think is junk you might not need that but i'd rather decide for myself so i always put that on so that it, if i don't need it i won't copy it but if i need it then it's there and i and i'm aware of it so i think that's useful to note if i go into the uh, hamburger over here and we look at the expenses side of things you will recall like if I could look at the expenses this way, and we have, of course, we'll have uh, the type of transactions that are expense transactions populating in here. If we wanted to sort our expenses that way, we we'll also have within the vendors, we've created two kinds of vendors uh, this time. So notice we have two vendors so that we can track the information kind of by location within each of those uh, vendors. And so your other option would be to have one vendor and then just still use this two different rules and all the data for the two locations would be under that one uh, vendor. So that's a difference there. All right. So this is where we stand on the balance sheet. So if you're and uh, so this is where we are at. And here's the good old profit and loss where we're standing as of this point in time. And then if you're following along, the trial balance is, I think, the easiest thing to use to check your numbers and we can break it out by months if we want to so there it is if your numbers tie out to these numbers great if not then you might change the date range sometimes it's the date range thing and then you can drill down to the source document and make any changes to that if you need to